David, how do you feel about Coach Cal being our next head coach at Arkansas? Well, Cal is one of the big names of the sport, but he is not one of the faces of this new generation and era of college basketball. We're we're learning who those names are right now in this tournament and over the last couple of tournaments for the last couple of years and everything that's happened. New faces are younger coaches who are on the rise right now in this sport. We are headed into a new generation of basketball. Cal's not really a part of it. Uh, the, if he's not going to change, uh, if, if he's not going to change, he's not a part of it. David? I mean, he's a legend. Well, today on the Hoop Southbound Show, we're recapping the national championship, talking about Cal coming to Fayetteville and the Kentucky coaching search. Guys, it's been an incredible season, and as we come to the end of this, we're right now watching on the TV, waiting for one shining moment to come on. Um, but we're watching Dan Hurley talking to the mic right now and recapping a back-to-back -back championship. Um, you know, Maddie, I watched this game from start to finish, uh, same as you. It was a good ball game in the first half, and then the second half, it was like UConn flipped on a switch and said, yeah, we're this team. Um Easily one of the most dominant performances I can remember in a tournament run. But, Maddie, what did you take away from this game individually as UConn um, just smokes Purdue for a back-to-back uh, -back -back national championship, the first one since 2007? Yeah, so, I mean, this game has been like any other competitive game that we've seen UConn play this season, which there haven't been very many, um, where it's pretty close in the first half. They go to the locker room. You see Hurley make those adjustments that need to be made, and they just come out and absolutely dominate. Um, you know, it's it's a true testament to how great of a coach he is when you get in there and you're able to, you know, just go in, make some notes at the half, and how good of a leader that he is as well, that he's able to get his team to hook onto those notes so well and push them to – dominant wins in a national championship game at that. Absolutely. And one of the things I noted, um, there was a couple of different things I know, but one of the things I noted is that the matchup between Edie and Klingon, Klingon didn't have to win that matchup. All he had to do was just push Edie as far back in the paint as he possibly could to create just a little disruption on offense. And then it was let the backcourt dominate the guards that Purdue had. Uh, and that's where UConn's defense excelled. Uh, and then you got effort players like Cam Spencer, who just all game long put effort into it. And then Tristan Newton, I mean, Final Four's most outstanding player, um, 20 points in this game tonight. He played incredible, um, just a solid all around performance for Tristan Newton. Um, and that was one of the things. But there came a point in this game, and I don't know if you felt it the same way, Maddie, but there came a clear point in this game where it didn't matter how many points Zach, e points Zach Eady was going to put up. If Purdue's backcourt wasn't going to produce, there was no hope. They did not have a path back. They did not have anything at all. In fact, I believe at the end of the game, what was it? Um, UConn ends up plus five from three in this game. Um, Purdue had no three point shots. They were leaning on Edie to carry them to a championship, putting their star. They gave their star player the ball, but they didn't give any give him any supporting cast in this one. And that was just a doomed after effect, um, you know, or a doomed situation because like they needed a complete team. UConn's a complete team in every which way, shape and form, because you don't know who it's going to be every game. They've got the right guys like Klingon, Tristan Newton, all these other players. But certainly when you're this good and you can go off at any point in time with different, different players and make the adjustments that you need. And that, that was this case for UConn. Yeah. And you know, I, I think, we've said several times this season, you can have one player that can drag you to a win, but you can't always rely on one player to drag you to a win. And, you know, I felt like that was kind of the case with Edie. Like you said, no matter how many points he scored, there was just no coming back. And, you know, what I really liked and kind of who I felt was one of the unsung heroes of the night, um, Johnson um, yeah. for Connecticut. I mean, he got in there. If he didn't have as many fouls as he did at the end of the first half, I think he would have baited Edie into getting into some foul trouble. And that may have been the first time we saw that in his collegiate career. 
Um, because, you know, as we've mentioned before, they don't call very many fouls on the guy. So, you know, baiting him into two kind of back-to-back fouls um, was big for UConn. And, you know, I think that was something they would have continued to uh, push forward if, you know, they weren't already in a bit of foul trouble there with Johnson. Definitely didn't want to get clinging in that situation as well. They, they definitely chose a path. And I, I'm like you, the the moment you put Johnson in this game, it was a clear decision that the game plan was to attack Purdue with athleticism um, and just to wear Edie down and everything. You He had to sit in this one for a little bit, but again, he played the, nearly the whole basketball game, for, you know, for Purdue, but it was very evident the plan was to get them to move and get them to move a lot. And just the sheer determination that UConn plays with to get to the basket and score is just a different, you know, game altogether. And the wh- way they do things, I, if, if everyone's not out taking notes right now about the way that UConn plays basketball, you're not going to succeed as well because they they have an outstanding game plan, a truly outstanding game plan. And the assist to turnover ratio should scream at people on how well coached this team is and how effective this game plan is for this team. So uh, I don't know <laughs> We'll see what happens with the future with Dan Hurley, um, you know, right now, because that name's being thrown around a lot and one of the other topics we're going to be talking about. But right now, he's gotten everything he needs to succeed at UConn. And so if they he comes back, reloads, we'll see what happens uh, in another in another year because there hasn't been a team who's really challenged UConn once the grass starts growing in March. Yeah, and I mean, you know, congrats to UConn. Fantastic game, fantastic game plan. First back to back since Florida. So, you know, big accomplishment. We'll see what happens next season if uh some of these teams, be it new, be it old, be it some form of transfer portal Thanos Stones collection that we hope to see Cal do in Fayetteville. Um, but hopefully, you know, well they'll they'll have a little bit of a challenge next year, no matter who it is. Oh yeah, certainly. Certainly. So, Maddie, obviously, I jumped on late last night, um, canceled our original show that we had planned and everything like that, because we got some just bizarre news in this conference. Uh, Just news that we just no one really anticipated news that was pretty much kept shut down quiet um, for the most part and was revealed by a local reporter at a Little Rock. And, you know, just like a random tweet by J.C. Hoops talking about like, John Calipari is at is at a Herman's rib house right now wearing a red tie. And everyone was like, yeah, right. And then it's like, y'all thought I was kidding. Um, yeah. So if you haven't heard the news or in fact, you've been living under a rock, John Calipari um, on, you know, is on the move to Arkansas of all places become the next head coach. Now, Matty, if you watch the live stream for everybody who was at home, most people know my opinion on my general thoughts on my immediate reaction. I've had a moment to refine those, but I want to give you the floor just a little bit to talk about what your thoughts were, because like, obviously I had an hour to go through this with Caleb and immediate reaction. We're sitting on it as the news is breaking. (laughs) Yeah, I know you asked me last night, you were like, Maddie, if you're going to keep commenting, just jump on live. I was in bed. I was watching that like any normal person would at, you know, a decent hour on a Sunday night. I'm just saying when the biggest basketball hire in like 20 years comes out, I I don't think uh, I I don't think you go to bed at that point. But go ahead, Maddie, you know, talk about your commitment to basketball. Well, I mean, I, I did not go to bed. I was obviously up watching, listening looking at everything um you know talked about it with a bunch of people today um had a lot of people ask me my opinion i said honestly my first thought was you know it was brought up i don't remember right before we started recording our planned podcast for last night or during or right after um you know we kind of talked about the cow rumors and you know i i kind of chalked it up to oh they're probably just rumors like everything else we'll probably promote an assistant and wait it out until next season and then it was like a firestorm it was like one after another and it started getting more and more serious and you're hearing more news and you know I'd I'd seen mention about how he was interested in Ohio State earlier in the year 
And, you know, that, that may have kind of been the leeway into, hey, if we get him out of Kentucky willingly, we won't have to pay him all this money. And here comes the Tyson family in Arkansas. Granted, our chicken nuggets for dinner tonight. Um, yep. Yep. So, um, you know, it it was kind of just a crazy 24 hours, really. Um, I feel like a lot happened. I feel like a lot more is happening. It's It's been a crazy week, honestly. You know, we got the news about Mus kind of into last week, and I feel like this is all kind of, you know, just – spiraled until we got to this point. I think it's going to keep spiraling um, until we hear more about the other job. But, you know, my first thoughts is I feel like there's definitely going to be need to be a different game plan coming into Arkansas. We've talked time and time again about Cal and his coaching at Kentucky. And as much as I think he could do here, it's going to have to be different because you're not going to be able to pull – one and dones. I don't think like you were able to at Kentucky. I don't know. He may surprise us. And we've talked time and time again about how the one and done way is kind of out. So I think it'll be interesting to see how he constructs this team. I'm not going to give expectations until I see some form of a roster since now we have a head coach and that's it at this point. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be a process. We're going to see who, who he gets and see what kind of game plan he's going to be able to work out with that roster. But as of right now, it's still kind of up in the air for me. Excited about the hire. I think he's going to do great things at Arkansas. I think it's going to reinvigorate him a little bit. Um, you know, I think him and Kentucky and the the toxicity that's been rumored, um, I, I think it'll help kind of put some pep back in him, back in his step and we'll see different things. Uh, maybe younger version of Coach Cal that, you know, those Kentucky fans were used to. Well, I, I think, you know, with the NIL situation that's been rumored to go along with this, and it's a huge influx of cash uh, that's dedicated specifically to basketball. It, it, it's, it's a re fresh restart for Cal as an opportunity for him to take advantage of the transfer portal. I agree. Um, you know, go after the best guys in the transfer portal. And then, in, you know, tie that in with the NBA talent that you've already been bringing in from your one and done system. It's not a problem to bring in one or two or three of those guys. The problem is, is when you have an entire roster of youth nowadays, and that's when it becomes exactly what we were talking about. It's like, how much are you going to trust these freshmen? Um, and that's when it becomes concerning. But, you know, for Cal in this situation, I think it's a really healthy situation for everybody involved. I wasn't kidding, and I still hold firm that Kentucky sh should have moved on from Cal, like we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. I hold firm to that because the expectations that John Calipari or the expectations that Kentucky has were not being met by John Calipari during the last five seasons or so. Um, 2019 could have certainly been a problem, or that 2019-2020 season certainly could have been a promising year, but we'll never know how that went out because there were other good teams out there too, like the Kansas Jayhawks um, before the tournament was canceled for, co canceled for COVID, but comes back, misses the tournament, does poorly in SEC play, um, comes back, you know, the last couple of years, has gotten decent seeds, but has not performed in March, but he's done well in conference play. What Cal Perry has done is not meet the Kentucky standards for the last several years, but he's been the reverse version of Musselman for the last several years where Eric Musselman has achieved in March and has done all right in conference play. Cal Perry has not met the expectations in March, and that was what we said he would be judged on constantly at Kentucky. But as far as how he's done in SEC play, it's been very good. So mm -hmm. what I was talking about like just if you're not going to go get so-and-so and whoever you get for your next head coach at Arkansas, it needs to be somebody with a high ceiling like that. That's got to be the minimum requirement. And what John Calipari, I feel like brings is a very elevated floor and a higher ceiling. Like right now, like he's been consistent enough over the years to where you can think this is going to get no worse than any of the years that you have Mike Anderson as the head coach at Arkansas. And those were seen as the stability years in Arkansas, trying to get that program back on track. 
And the way that he's been performing, it should be no worse than what, you know, the situation was with Mike Anderson in Arkansas. If anything, it may be a little bit more consistent. Um, so that's that's the minimum expectation right now for John Calipari. But with this NIL influx and the support he's going to get at Arkansas, certainly like at some point Arkansas is expecting some deep runs in March. So that's going to be where the adaptation conversation comes from. And these things I've been critical about Cal for the last several years, but I, I don't think it's also something to ignore when the expectations at Arkansas are very different than the expectations at Kentucky. And that's not to say Arkansas isn't a big time program because, oh boy, when they did this hire, that removed all doubt of that situation. Straight up, like Arkansas is a top 15 program. There's no conversation to be had besides, you know, Arkansas is capable of these hires. They're capable of putting a large amount of money into their program and they're capable of expecting to have big things happen because of the investment that they put into their program. Um, so a five-year deal for John Calipari, I think you expect some sweet 16s. I think just the same as Kentucky was, but I don't think it's the exact same thing. I think he's got more cushion in year one than a lot of other coaches, even in year two. Um, but we're going to have to watch the recruiting trail to see how this goes because the ceiling we certainly know how high that ceiling can be, which is the thing that a lot of Kentucky fans were holding on to with John Calipari, who were the ones who were very supportive of John Calipari still being the coach that, you know, Kentucky wants. But for Arkansas's expectations, if you're going regularly deep in March and you're flirting with that final four, that's exactly what you want. Um, so I think it's also a healthy situation. Like I said, him leaving that, job in Kentucky to get some youth there in that Kentucky job and new ideas and a new coach and someone who could be very promising for Kentucky's future to get them back at the expectations they have. Meanwhile, you have a coach who's going to continue the stability that we've seen at Arkansas, who has a very high ceiling um, in comparison. So I think it's a great hire. And I think it's also a great move for Kentucky you know, with him leaving um, one that they also don't have to pay a thirty three million dollar buyout for. Um, and so that opens a lot of opportunity for who's going to be Kentucky's new head coach. Um, but, Maddie, let's go through some of this just a little bit here. You know, Cal's coming in on that five year contract, uh, looking at his resume a little bit. He's got in total. Uh, 813 games won. He's less than 200 wins away from cracking the thousand win mark. Um, in his conference record, he's got over 300. He's got 390 wins in conference all time as a college basketball coach and 31 conference titles as a college basketball coach. It's been sensational. And he's just three games short of 60 in the NCAA tournament. Um Dick Vitale had some words on this hire, echoing some of the same thoughts that we had. He said, now the big question is, in the John Calipari move to Arkansas, uh, how many Kentucky players and recruits will follow? I agree with Seth David Ho Davis Hoops that there needs to be a there was need for a fresh break. Uh, there was or there was need for a fresh break was needed by Kentucky uh, and John Calipari. Uh, that was from Dick Vitale um, in his Twitter account. Um, so, Maddie. Looking at this situation, we also got word today that Trevor Brazil is jumping into the NBA draft, and then Isaiah Elohim is asking out of his NLI for the Razorbacks. Maddie, there's no one coming in, and mm -hmm. there's no one on the roster. This is a completely fresh, clean reset for the Razorbacks. Um, before I get into that, because we know there's a long list of players who are transferring out, the other side of this is the roster situation for Kentucky. Now, they've got some NBA players that we need to talk about. And right now in the top 50, Rob Dillingham, Reed Shepard, Justin Edwards, who's already declared for the NBA draft, uh, Onyanso, uh, I, I always mess up that name, and DJ yes, Wagner, sir. yeah, thank you, uh, are all in the top 50 out of Kentucky and ESPN's best available list for this year's NBA draft. So those are names I would expect to be leaving. Um, but Kentucky's still got guys like Big Z, um, Jordan Burks, who just hit the, uh, or not Jordan Burks. Uh, yeah, he did. No, it was Joey Hart who just announced today that he's going to hit the transfer portal, um, who could possibly transfer. And then of course you've also got just a loaded, the number two ranked freshman class in the country. Um, you know, with five-star Jaden Quintance, uh, Boogie Flan, Samto Cyril, Carter Knox, who has reopened his recruitment, uh, Billy Richmond and Travis Perry for Kentucky. 
Maddie, how many names do you think are going to follow Cal, especially with this influx of NIL that Arkansas has given him to put together a roster? How many players off of that list? And then how many players in the transfer portal do you think are coming back or can he go find uh, for the Razorbacks? I mean, you know, it, it's one of those things I've kind of tossed back and forth all day as we've been thinking about, okay, so now we have a coach. We no longer have a team whatsoever. You got to think there's a couple of those Arkansas players that may reconsider um, being in the transfer portal that may, you know, allow Coach Cal to recruit them to stay at Arkansas. And then, like you said, there's a lot of talent on that Kentucky team um, that can either – follow those incoming freshmen um, or that can transfer that are on that current Kentucky roster. I feel like we'll at least see a handful, um, four to five players from, you know, each side stick around or come to Arkansas uh, just because, you know, it's Coach Cal. I'm sure a lot of those Arkansas players didn't think they'd ever have the opportunity to play for him in the first place. So that that would be a major, major step in the right direction. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, a lot of those players decided to go to Kentucky because of who Coach Cal is and his legacy at Kentucky. Um, and especially if you're getting a big chunk of NIL, that can't hurt. You know, no, if you're getting can't. a paycheck out of it, might as well go play ball. I'm yeah. telling you that red looks a little bit better than blue on some people. So <laughs> uh, think of what you're saying. But, you know, I think the big thing for me, um, and, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, it's going to be those Razorback fans giving him a little bit of grace because, you know, with the name comes that high expectation. But like I said, we don't have a team yet. We don't know who's coming. We don't know who's going. And we don't know what Cal's got up his sleeve in terms of recruitment. Like he pulled out a miracle last season um, with – Trey Mitchell keeping um, Antonio Reeves around. So it, it's going to be one of those things that, you know, it, it may be in the last hour that we have a full team together. Um, but he's going to have to have some grace going into this first season because, you know, raise your back. Fans, variables undetermined right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, agree. They're already expecting greatness. And I'm like, whoa, pump the brakes. We've got a lot more to discuss than just, okay, we got a great coach. We're going to win a national championship. Yeah, especially between now and Decision Day, because they, we God knows what's going to happen between now and then. But let's talk about also, because this will lead us into the next part of this conversation, which is huge, um, the domino effect. You know, SMU fires their coach, and then they go out and hire Andy Enfield um, from, you know, USC. And then USC goes out gets the guy for the job that they really want, which is Eric Musselman. And those conversations had been going on for a while between Muss and USC. It's an opportunity for Muss to go back to his home region um, there in Southern California. That leaves open, uh, you know, Arkansas, which is a huge job. And again, after this John Calipari hire, I don't think that you can dispute about how big of a job Arkansas is. It's just, you know, it's just not people blowing smoke. It's national people. It's regional people. Arkansas is a huge job when it comes to college basketball. Um, but yeah, sure enough, going out and getting John Calipari is just a massive hire that, of course, opens up the best job in the country. Um, and if you don't think it's the best job in the country, no dispute, it's a top five job. Um, mm -hmm. So just a huge, huge opening right now in college basketball that's sitting alone right now as the only P6 job that's open in the country. They have no competition. Um, all these other P6 jobs have been filled up across the board. Um, but here's Kentucky now, the last one at the table right now, and it can send massive shockwaves through what's going to happen in college basketball, because whatever hire is about to occur, unless it's Billy Donovan out of the NBA, it's going to have even more ripple effect across college basketball and what's going to happen next. So Maddie, we're going to talk about this Kentucky job, but you know, it's just one piece at a time, how this carousel goes. But like right now there's, there's a, there's a power vacuum that is wide open and yeah. I, we we were kind of talking about it, me and Caleb last you know last night when we went live. 
just imagine if Scott Drew gets hired out of Baylor because that's going to open Jerome Tang up to go to Baylor, and then that's going to open the Kansas State job, and then who knows where it goes from there because that's another Power Six job that's open. Um, that could be the simplest path. There could be a much more complicated path that opens up and creates another power vacuum uh, from another program. But your thoughts on just the ripple effect that this is going to have with arguably one of the best jobs of the country opening up. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit. I've talked about it a lot today. Um, you know, one of the big names that was being floated around was Nate Oates. Yeah. Um, we saw him release a statement that, you know, Alabama's his team. He's not going anywhere. Um, so that, you know, protects a little bit of chaos from outside or inside the SEC. You know, I've seen Bruce Pearl's name get thrown thrown around. Um, and then I believe it was one of the commentators. I don't remember which one pregame to the Purdue UConn said, if I'm Kentucky, I'm reaching out to Dan Hurley right after they win this championship. I'm making him say no. I'm making him say <laughs> no. Well, OK, so this let's go through some of the names like you mentioned Bruce Pearl and Nate Oates. Um, I didn't have room for five on this graphic, but yeah, Bruce Pearl was a name that we also had heard a little bit. That's another one right now because Auburn's trying to invest big time in their basketball program and trying to grow it. And, you know, that could be another huge job that opens up. But, yeah, the four most dominant names were Nate Oates, Billy Donovan, Scott Drew and Dan Hurley. Um, now the diff, one of these things, not like the other Billy Donovan's obviously the thing that's, you know, different. He's outside college basketball nowadays, and he's coaching with the Chicago Bulls. Um, Billy Donovan, obviously tonight with a night that hit with history with the national championship, um, was the last coach to go back to back other than Dan Hurley. Uh, and he's had a great career in college basketball with Florida and won 10 conference titles in his career. Um, two national titles, uh, a great, you know, tournament record. Um, Dan, you know, it, Billy Donovan would be a sensational hire. I don't know if it's going to happen or not right now because the Bulls are trying to get into the NBA playoffs right now. And I believe yeah, they're, they're in the that. Play on, playing on the 17th, I believe. Yeah, playing on the 17th. So nine days from now. Nine that's days. A, that's a long time to leave a vacant job. A long time to leave a vacant job in what is going to be a very critical time period. Um, for Kentucky for moving forward. So right now this, you know, if you wait on Billy Donovan and or Billy Donovan is not willing to leave his current job more quickly than than not, you you create a problem for yourself, um, you know, for next season. So if you want Billy Donovan, you're going to have to just write off next year. Like that's that's just the fact. Um, and, you know, you may be able to pull some stuff together late in the portal cycle, all before decision day, who knows? But overall, if you wait on Billy Donovan, you're asking for some things to not go your way for next season. And you're really waiting for year two of the Billy Donovan area era to really take off in Kentucky. Um, the other one that I found super interesting as a name was Dan Hurley. And, of course, he just won another national championship tonight. Um, he's won four conference titles uh, in his tenure as a coach, just under 300 wins, over 150 wins in conference play. Very good NCAA tournament record. Very good one, especially because of just how dominant he's been over the last two years. But it, 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 he's a force. Um, but let's not ignore the program that he comes from. He comes from one of the biggest brands also in college basketball, which is UConn. Now, out of the Blue Bloods, and Maddie, you may disagree or you know agree or disagree, but you're talking about a school with a very small football program um, that may not bring as much money back in as when basketball is the dominant is the biggest sport in UConn. Um, that goes in UConn's favor, but they don't produce the same money that a program like Kentucky would. So you got to ask out of if out of the UConn situation. Is UConn a job that Dan Hurley would sit at or pass on, or would would Dan Hurley stay at UConn over an opportunity to coach at Kentucky? UConn's a top, easy top ten job, top ten job in college basketball right now. It's a blue blood program, mm -hmm. but would he leave UConn to go to Kentucky? He's from See, the Northeast too. Yeah. That that's where my hang up is. Um, you know, another one that they kind of touched on earlier before the game, you know, uh mentioned he's from New Jersey. You know, it's kind of a homegrown area up there. A bunch of people that are 
born and raised up there tend to stay that that direction. And like you said, Northeast is big on basketball. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Kentucky is a school where basketball is pretty much the main sport. Um, but when you get into SEC, you obviously have to compete with other programs um, for notoriety. Um, Kentucky, like we said, is a little bit different, but um, you you still got to kind of put up a fight for yourself um, and make sure that you know your name is louder than the other coaching staff around you, pretty much, um, which tends to be unfortunate because you you've got to build your own kind of competition against your own program. Um, but I don't, you know, it's, it's a hard question, I think, because it's, you know, one of these things is not like the other kind of situation. Um, well, he's established, um, he's regional to the area. Um, he's at a big time program right now. He's the biggest coach at that school. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, not being part of the anatomy or the, the autonomous, the autonomous five or the a five as they call in the NCAA, um, the Big East is a power conference in basketball, but they're not part of the self-governorship of the NCAA. So you give up that criteria uh, for continuing, you know, at, at a Big East program. The current direction that college sports is heading, say moving to Kentucky is a good move. But for you personally, is it a good move? Like, you know, for most coaches, it would be, um, you know, but for Dan Hurdley's situation, I. I, I, it's, it's as good as a coin flip. Uh, it feels like in that conversation. Um, but like, make no mistake about it. The big East, the sec and the, and the, um, and the big 12 are arguably the three best conferences in college basketball right now, uh, mm -hmm. in every way. And right now, Dan Hurley's at a really good spot. Um, so it would have to be a dang good offer from Kentucky if they want to go that direction. Um, so it, it's tough. And then also just think about the names that Dan Hurley's inserted himself with and that have come out of that conference, uh, Jim Beheim, uh, John Thompson, um, you know, you can Rick Pitino, um, you, you can go down the list and I know Pitino also coached at Kentucky, but he, you know, Providence Friars and the Louisville Cardinals back when Louisville was part of the big East. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of coaches that are associated with that league historically. That is a prominent, prominent basketball league. So it's it's a it's an interesting conversation that for the Dan Hurley situation, but if Kentucky pulled that off, I mean, certainly, certainly it's a great move. Um, and then the other name that's a big one is Scott Drew. Now you remember last year when we were talking about the chaos behind the scenes situation at Kentucky um, that I think was part of what moved Cal on out of Kentucky last season, where. It, the athletic department, not maybe, maybe not supporting Cal enough. Um, you know, the name that came out of Mitch's, you know, Mitch's mouth, uh, you know, with the leak from Kyle Tucker and everything, I think that's who wrote that article was a replacement for Cal would be Scott Drew. That's who he wanted out of Baylor. And Scott Drew, we've talked about, you know, a couple of times he built Baylor basketball. Um, yeah. I know some fans are kind of downing, you know, Kentucky fans who don't necessarily want Scott Drew are kind of downing his all time record and everything else. And it's like, if you remove the championship year, what is Baylor guide? Well, he built the program is what it is. And a program that had very little history before Scott Drew. So what Scott Drew has done at Baylor upon itself is impressive. And he he's a builder. And he's a guy who can win a national championship and go deep. And he's want, played in one of the toughest basketball conferences in the country. Um, Maddie, your thoughts on Scott Drew, because I, I certainly don't think it's a bad pick. Yeah, I think it's one of the best options available um, because, you know, like we said, Dan Harley's coin flip. I don't think he would leave UConn, especially coming off back to back championships. Um, it would be unprecedented. It, it would be seemingly unprecedented if he did. Yeah. And then, you know, next big name, like we said, Billy Donovan, you're going to have to play the waiting game and see if he's even interested at this point. But Scott Drew, like you said, there's a lot of fans that, you know, are asking what what is there? Obviously, when you when you're building a program, sometimes those win win loss records are going to be a little skewed. You're not going to have phenomenal teams, phenomenal recruits from the ground up. You're going to start getting those along the way, and that's when they really start to matter, when you start showing progress, showing growth. And, you know, it kind of makes me think of 
you know, the the rich get richer euphemism. You know, if you're a kid and you start out with a million dollar loan from your parent, it's going to be a lot easier to build a business than somebody who's picking up cans on the side of the road to build their business. Yeah, oh, certainly. And with the Scott Drew situation, let's not forget, Baylor's not the biggest brand in Texas. Not even in basketball, Baylor's not the biggest brand in Texas. Um, you know, they're not, they're a private institution, um, you know, with not the same. So, I mean, and they're in a small city in Texas, you know, like not, you know, they're in Waco. They're in between Austin, Dallas, Houston, and all these other major metropolitan areas. It's not like Texas A&M, who's super close to Houston and, you know, Texas, who's implanted right in the heart of Austin. You know, it, it's not the same thing at all. Um, you know, and this is not a program with any history really outside of mm -hmm. Scott Drew, you know, like they hadn't, we were talking about that during the Tennessee conversation about like our expectations for Tennessee. It's like everybody's path can be different. It was certainly different for Scott Drew. So I, I don't really have a problem with Scott Drew being the next head coach at Kentucky. Certainly fans may lose their patience because they expect immediate results. But I think overall, if you hired Scott Drew, it would be a very, Linear, maybe a linear progressive hire, you know, like give him a couple of years and he'll build something special because he's a name that right now he's building good. He's putting good basketball teams out there. He's yep. putting good basketball teams together year in and year out at a not the biggest school in Texas. Certainly not the biggest school in Texas by any means, but he and he's done a phenomenal job. Um, 90 percent of teams out there in the country. They wouldn't mind having a guy like Scott Drew, you know, coaching their team. So um, I, I think it's I think it would be a good one. But that's the that's the conversation. So we asked on Twitter um, for you guys on what you thought and who you thought should be the next coach at Kentucky. And, um, you know, number one on that list was Scott Drew at thirty four point eight percent. The second place pick was Nate Oates at twenty eight point eight percent, which right now seems like it's certainly off the table. And then Dan Hurley at 22.7%. Um, you guys voted for Dan Hurley. It's nothing like the Arkansas search when we uh, threw some names out there and it was dominant for one name. Uh, this one's a little bit more balanced. And then Billy Donovan's getting 13.6%. Um, that may also be an age gap too with people, some younger fans not being completely aware of who Billy Donovan was in the uh, 2000s and moving into the 2010s. So that may be part of it, but... Who knows? Um, may also just be very conscious about the NBA situation going on with Billy Donovan. But heck of a hey, this is going to be a heck of a coaching search and one that's going to be. It's going to make an earthquake. It's going to make an earthquake for whoever that hire is. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it makes me excited because our offseason content is going to be absolutely electric. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic which is all the more reason for you guys at home watching right now to like and subscribe. Guys, uh, we are wrapping up what has been a fun season of college basketball, but the way that things are shaping up, it's going to be an electric off offseason um, with the chaos that's ensuing. I mean, the biggest job in college basketball this opened up, a Hall of Famer just moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas, or is expected to be announced tomorrow morning as the new head coach. So you got a Hall of Famer moving to another top 15 program, uh, in college basketball, Tennessee, can they make another run next year? You know, all these conversations. And then Nate Oates uh, also right now looks like he can return a lot of talent. He's got some young stars coming to his team there in Alabama. So there's a lot of foot things that can happen this offseason and a lot of content to stay up with. So please like and subscribe uh, to the show and we will catch you guys next week. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.